Let's pray. All right, let's begin. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this day as we study your word. We ask, O oh Lord, that uh, you would help us make the decisions that uh, are beneficial not just to us, but also those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Good morning, Dave. Morning. All right. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> Did I remind you? Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Well, we're on chapter faster than mine, then. <laughs> uh, it's just, I think it's still thought it was Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Let's begin with chapter 12. Uh, and uh, Dennis, you want to take that? Sure. And Miriam and Aaron with her spoke against Moses concerning the Cushite wife he had taken, for he had taken a Cushite, is that a Cushite wife? Cushite. And they said, is it but through Moses alone that the Lord has spoken? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard and the man Moses was very humble, more than any person on the face of the earth. And the Lord said suddenly to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, go out and the three of you to the tent of meeting. And the three of them went out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And the two of them went out and he said, listen, pray to my words, if your prof prophet be the Lord's in a vision to him, would I be known in a dream? Would I speak through him? Not so, my servant Moses. In all my house is he trusted. Mouth to mouth do I speak with him. The vision and not in riddles and the like, likeness of the Lord he beholds. And why did you not fear to speak against my servant Moses? And the, and the Lord's wrath flared against them and he went off. And the cloud moved off from uh, over the tent and look, Miriam was blanched as snow and Aaron turned to Miriam and look, she was struck with skin blanch. And Aaron said to Moses, I beseech you, my Lord, pray do not put us to the offense which we did foolishly and by which we offended. Let her not be pray like one dead who, when he comes out of his mother's womb, half of his flesh is eaten away. And Moses cried out to the Lord saying, God, pray, heal her, pray. And the Lord said to Moses, had her father spat in her face, would she not be shamed seven days, be shut up seven days outside the camp, and afterward she would be <clears throat> gathered back in? And Miriam was shut up outside the camp seven days, and the people did not journey onward until Miriam was gathered back in. And afterward the people journeyed on from Hezeroth, and they camped in the wilderness of Paran. Paran, right. All right. Should I continue? Uh, now let's give somebody else a chance, too. Um, Dave, you want to take footnotes? Yeah. And Miriam and Aaron with her spoke against Moses. This is one of the most striking instances of an expressive grammatical device in ancient Hebrew prose. When there are two or more subjects of a verb, but a singular verb is used. Here, the feminine singular. There is a thematic focus on the first of the subjects as the principal agent in the action stipulated through the verb. This trans translation adds with her to suggest an equivalent effect. Thus Abraham ben Ezra, she spoke, and Aaron assented or was silent. So he too was punished. It is Miriam, of course, who will be stricken with the skin disease. The expression uh, diver often means to speak against, but in a, in a punning way. It can also refer, as it does repeatedly in this episode, beginning with Aaron's and Miriam's dialogue in the next verse, 
to God speaking through a prophet. Verse 8 here also uses diver, but because of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth idiom, in that one instant, it is translated as speak with. The Cushite wife is, is the Zipporah, only if one locates Cush in Midian, which some interpreters find grounds for doing. Otherwise, Cush might be a destination for Nubia or Ethiopia, which would make this, this wife black. If she is a second wife, the objection might simply be the fact that Moses had compromised Sephora, Sephora's privilege status by this second marriage. It could reflect racial disapproval. If Miriam and Aaron are referring to Zephora, the object would simply be to her coming from a different ethnic national group. In either way, they mean to suggest that Moses' marital behavior is unworthy of a prophetic leader, and hence evidence that he does not deserve to be the exclusive vessel of prophecy. He has not spoken through us as well. This familiar murmuring should be read against the background of the immediately <clears throat> there are two people a, a dad and uh, were singled out a dad and medad were singled out as instruments of prophecy now these two sib siblings came come forth to propose themselves as candidates for the same role. Though there is a scant, scant indication in the earlier narratives that God has been speaking directly through them, despite Miriam's designation <laughs> as prophetess in Exodus. Moses, Moses responded to the prophesizing of Edad and Medad by wishing that the whole people might be endowed with the spirit of prophecy. In flagrant contrast, Miriam and Aaron pretend that their brother has been treated, been treating prophecy as a private monopoly, and their view of the prophetic spirit is of something one can seize as a means of privilege and power. The great biblical theme of sibling rivalry, <laughs> until now absent from the story of Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, here makes an appearance. And the man Moses was very humble. As we have noted before, seen in Exodus, the man quite exceptionally is a kind of epitaph <laughs> for Moses. His humble or unassuming character is reflected here in the fact that he has not troubled to listen or has paid no attention to the malicious rumors about him that Miriam and Aaron, Aaron have initiated. God, however, has heard. The Lord said suddenly, the use of suddenly to introduce divine speech is quite unusual. Uh, Nemedes proposes an interesting explanation. Miriam and Aaron, having made their dubious declaration that through them too God had spoken, were not at the moment thinking of an expected prophecy, and for Moses' sake it came upon them without invitation. Prophecy, that is, proves to be an abrupt and frightening business, not the commodity of power they had imagined. Thus, in the next verse, God, ha having called out 
called to all three siblings, singles out Miriam and Aaron, and pre preemptory direct address. Listen, pray to my words. God's speech to Miriam and Aaron takes the exalted form of poetry. One of the conventions for being a biblical poem is an exhortation for those addressed to hearken to the utterances of the poet. Compare the first of many instances in Genesis. Ada and Zyla say, Zyla, oh, hearken my voice. If your prophet be the Lord's, the Hebrew text is cryptic. Perhaps through scribal error, perhaps merely because of the compacted language of archaic poetry. The literal Hebrew word sequence is, if there be your prophet, the Lord, the second and third of these word units might be an ellipsis for the prophet of the Lord. And both the Septuagint and the Vulgate <clears throat> Job of or for the Hebrew particle. A couple of other ancient versions also reflect a prophet of a, a reading of a prophet among you. Various modern textual critics move the Lord, Yahweh, either, either back to the verb said at the beginning of the verse or forward to the next clause, leaving if there be a prophet among you. Vision and dream. For an ordinary prophet, God reveals himself through an oblique imaging process in vision or dream. My servant Moses, in all my house, is he trusted? Trusted Neiman is an exempt, expected qualifier for servant. E Evid, Moses figures here as a kind of faithful major domo given the keys to God's household and vision and not in riddles. Although vision has been noted as one of the two vehicles of communication with the ordinary prophet, in Moses's case, it is no enigma enigmatic vision, but a perfectly clear image as he and he alone is privileged to look upon the likeness of the Lord. Blanched as snow. If the Cushite woman is actually black, this sudden draining of pigmentation as Jacob uh, Mil Milgram notes would be more than poetic justice for Miriam's slander. The rhetorical con contrast between Aaron's petition to Moses and Moses' petition to God is pointed. Aaron's speech is relatively lengthy and centers on an elaborate and horrifying simile of stillbirth for Miriam's skin disease. Perhaps that, smart, that simile is dictated by Aaron's consciousness of the sibling bond between Miriam and her two brothers. Look, the three of us were born into life from the same womb, and now our sister is suffering a fate no better than that of a stillborn fetus. Moses' prayer is a mere five Five words and five syllables, both in the Hebrew and in this translation, devoid of any metaphysical, meta, metatorical elaboration or explanation and circumstance. A kind of pure verbal uh, dis, dis, distillate of imperatively urgent plea. The starkness of the languages or the language makes it all the more affecting. 
Compare Rashi's comment on the urgency of the language. Why did not Moses pray at length so that the Israelites would not say, his sister is in distress and he is standing and going on and on in prayer? Shut up seven days outside the camp. This does not appear to be the usual medical quarantine for this disease, which would be 14 days. But to judge by the immediate context, it's rather a period of isolation until the public shaming Miriam has undergone will no longer be fresh. Gathered back in, this is the same location used by Moses' return to the camp in numbers. The repeated usage underscores a thematic antithesis. Moses was gathered back into the camp from which he had gone out to stand before the tent of meeting after sharing his spirit of prophecy with the 70 elders. <laughs> Miriam is gathered back into the camp after having been excluded from it in punishment because she had complained that Moses was monopolizing the spirit that by right belonged equally to her and to Aaron. <clears throat> in the first instance, we have a gesture of consolidating political unity. Second instance, a divisive complaint. Okay, let's uh, open that up for discussion for a couple of minutes. Well, just for sheer fact, the discussion, I think they had a valid argument. <clears throat> they have a valid argument? Yeah, they had, they shared equally in the, in the prophecy, at least in their minds they did. Well, they may have shared equally in the prophecy, but do you remember that uh, the story of Moses and, and the burning bush, where God says He will He will use Aaron uh, as spokesperson for Moses, and that they were to see Moses as as the one on top, the the as God to them. <laughs> Um, <coughs> that uh, they wanted to take uh, some of the spirit. The spirit was God's spirit, and he's giving it out. Uh, gave it to the 70 elders of Israel and the like. They've, they've gone through that. Um, Moses didn't take it. It was given to him. Um and so when you hear Miriam and uh, Aaron arguing, and it's and the source of that argument is a displeasure with the Cushite wife. Um, that's in a place they belonged. Well, the, they're in. Midian, aren't they? Are they no, working? Miriam, Miriam is from the same mother and father as Moses. Miriam was a sister that overlooked Moses when he was in the Isabel. in the water, and then went and got uh, asked the uh, queen whether she wanted uh, uh, somebody to to nurse the child, and uh, went and got his mother, and mother became you know, surrogate mother, as far as the queen was concerned, uh, and got to enjoy her baby until he was weaned, which would have been about four or five. <clears throat> so they were brother and sister. Uh, and so was Aaron. So, that, you know, they're all from the same mother. And they are Israelites. Who was older, Aaron or Moses? Aaron. Okay, so Moses actually was Moses the, was a little one, right? Okay. Yes, and in the footnote it says this first instance of sibling war bribery, bribery between between Moses and Aaron. 
I seem to detect that in a few before there was some resentment going on. Well, you know, <laughs> it's, a big it's sinful events of people. That's just the way they are. Okay. Uh, it comes up at times. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> needs to be repented of, needs to move on. The, but you're, you're seeing somebody pick something in this case. They don't know what it was that uh, the <laughs> man had the wife. It was not Zipporah. It's a, another wife. It is also thought that Zipporah passed and that uh, Moses then took a second wife. So, uh, however you want to look at that, it, it was a matter of uh, it, it showed itself in simply rivalry, but it was more that they needed a bone of contention. Well, okay. What do you got on it? Was Buddy here today? Yeah. Yeah. Uh oh. Okay, this uh, removal of pigmentation. And that was some form of punishment? Was... I think that would be a visual, you know, rather than anything more than that, but it did it, it, uh, not just removing of the pigmentation, but this was looked at as leprosy. And, you know, that excludes you from the, the family, the tribes. That's why she he was put out of the camp. Um, putting out of the camp for only seven days is, uh, you know, was the Lord's punishment. Don't speak against my man. So why didn't they just say it was leprosy? Well, in, in translation, I, I, leprosy is is a tricky term. We we yeah. use it to mean Hansen's disease, and in in biblical, you know, kind of scholarship, that's not considered accurate. So, but, but you know, living out in the desert, living out in the Sinai Desert or wherever, people are sub, and you know, given the state of plumbing and so forth, uh, people are subject to all kinds of skin diseases. Yeah. Well. Uh... The, the term or translations at the time has been to, to call it leprosy. So, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, the, the 16th century English yes. called it leprosy for lack of a better term, but but scholars point out that it's not what we think of as leprosy. So, not, not necessarily what we would call leprosy, but there are all kinds of bad skin diseases out there. Well, what what is this referral or what the author says something about a Racial thing. Well, because I, I was kind of, I was kind of wondering what been... this like woman is is doing so far north, but yeah. that's kind of a trivial question. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities there, yeah. because Cush and Put are put by by scholars as being well. Well, he's right. They're they're generally put down as uh, Ethiopia or someplace you know far south. I I thought it might be Yemen, right? Because there are a lot of Yemenite Jews in Israel, but that's a separate issue. But um, uh, and, and they're not black. They're they're dark people, but they're not black. Uh, but um, you know, Kush could be in in Yemen. It's sometimes put Kush and put are thought to be maybe Ethiopia, Somalia, someplace over there. But uh, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, and uh, Yemen are not that far, far apart as far as the the crow flies. And um, uh, there there are you know we we have this kind of 1920th century of sense of geography and uh, back in ancient times, I mean, people kind of wandered around wherever the water was, wherever their 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 crops and their herds were going. So they might not have stuck to the borders that we we think of as strictly, or or she might have been traded as a slave. Who knows? You know. So those Nubians go way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the southern border of Egypt there. So. Yeah, was she Nubian? Was she Ethiopian? Was she a, a, a Yemenite? Uh, all those things are possible. What's she doing up in the northern Sinai Desert? 
There are probably a lot of answers for that, a lot of possibilities. Okay. Um, one line in that discussion, uh, the description of Moses, um, that he was a humble person. We see that in in uh, his actions and the like. And um, he describes his ability to speak, his stuttering. Um, I find it very interesting that uh, God uses the, the weak to lead the strong. Here you have a man in the, the, or the Israelites in the highest position. And uh, he needs the people around him to, to, to assign to do the different things. And he speaks with God, yet he's the one that has the stutter. I think it shows the beauty of, uh, of our God and how great he is. That uh, be used as that. I always think of the, well, I can think two two things like that. You know, President Biden stutters. He's, I'm sure he's struggled with that mightily all his life, but he seems like he did, turned out okay. And also that King's English, remember that movie years ago? Yeah, George the Six, I guess. Yeah. It wasn't his father, I think it was. And he stuttered too, and that's, that's if I remember right. They, that's back when, when he had to go on the radio, you know, to uh, for whatever function that he that he carried out. Yeah, and it was it was really a battle for him. And I don't know if he ever overcame it. Uh, in all honesty. So Moses had probably really struggled with that during his lifetime. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea that he that he was a stutterer. I didn't know until we we took mm -hmm. up this, this class because he wasn't stuttering in the Ten Commandments. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we did hear, we did hear. Or it was recorded for us that God spoke first the Ten Commandments and then the children of Israel wanted Moses to stand in between because they were afraid that if they continued to listen to him, they would die. Um, and God said that was a good idea. <laughs> um, well, okay. stuttering and, and Sibling rivalry, they certainly humanize these towering figures, something something we can relate to today. Well, you know, it shows the difference um, between a, a true record and one where, you know, you polish it up. The scriptures tell just the way it was. Okay. Let's uh, go on with the next then. Chapter 13. Uh, buddy, you want to take that? Sure. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, uh, send you men that they uh, um, scout the land of Canaan, which I'm about to give to the Israelites. One man each for his father's tribe, every one of them a chieftain. And Moses went, went uh, sent them from the wilderness of Haran to the, uh, by the Lord's word, all of, all of the men, heads of the Israelites they were. And these are their names for the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, the son of uh, Zakur, for the uh, tribe of Simeon, uh, Sh Sh Shaphat, the son of Ori, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, uh, son of Jephmune. Uh, for the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joseph. For the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, son of Nun. 
for the tribe of Benjamin, Palfi, son of uh, Raphu, for the tribe of Zebulun, uh, Gadiel, son of uh, Sadi, for the tribe of Joseph, the tribe of, tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, son of Susi, for the tribe of Dan, uh, Amiel, son of uh, Gamali, for the tribe of Asher, Sether, son of Michael, for the tribe of Naphtali, uh, Nabi, son of Voshi, for the tribe of Gad, Genel, son of Machai. These are the names of the men who Moses sent to scout the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. And Moses sent them to scout the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up this way through the Negev, that you shall go up into the high country. And you shall see the land, what it is like, and the people that dwell in it. And they are strong or or slack, and they are few or many. And what is the land uh, in which they dwell? Is it good or bad? And what are the towns in which they dwell? Are they open settlements or in fortresses? And what is the land? Is it fat or lean? Or are there trees in it or not? And you shall master strength and take of the fruit of the land. And the season was the season of the first ripe grapes. And they went up and scattered the land from the wilderness of Zin to the uh, Rahab on Leho Hamath. And they went up to the Negev and came to Hebron. And, and, there, and there were uh, Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, offspring of the giant. And Hebron had been built seven years before, before someone in Egypt. And they came to uh, Wadi uh, Eshkol, and they, they cut off from there a branch in one cluster of grapes, and bore it on a pole with two men, and of the pomegranates and of the dates. That place was called Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster that the Israelites cut off there. And they came back from scouting the land at the, at the end of 40 days, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, and to all the community of Israelites at the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back back word to them and to all the community and showed them the fruit of the land. And they recounted to him and said, we came into the land to which you sent us, and it's actually flowing with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. But mighty is the people that dwell in the land, and the towns are fortified and very big, and also the offspring of the giant we saw there. Amalek dwells in the Negev land, and the Hittite and, and Jeb- Jebusite, and the Amorite dwell in the high country, and the Canaanite dwells by the sea and by the Jordan. And Caleb silenced the people around Moses and said, We will surely go up and take hold of it, for we will surely prevail over it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they put forth an ill report to the Israelites of the land they had scouted, saying, uh, the land through which we pass to scout is a land that consumes those who dwell in it. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of huge measure. And there did we see the Nephilim, sons of the giant from the Nephilim. And we were on our own, and, and we were in our own eyes like grasshoppers. And so we were in their eyes. Okay. Uh, all right. <clears throat> We might, uh, there, there was a mistake I, I passed along a few weeks ago. I was talking about the uh, the lost book or the uh, apocryphal book of Jasher, and I mistakenly confused it with the book of Asher. Asher was a tribe, and Jasher is just the name of this book. And although there was a forgery that was passed along to Joseph Smith in the early 19th century by somebody or other, it was actually a real book. And Jasher just means the just man, book of the just man. And the book is referenced in Samuel, uh, another book, and by uh, Apostle Paul. So it was known to people, but it wasn't included in the canon for whatever reasons. And uh, according to Orthodox theologians, when they write about Apocrypha, there's Apocrypha and Apocrypha. If the Apocrypha doesn't contradict the canon, the scriptures, it's kind of okay to read. Uh, if it does, then, you know, it's off limits. So I think the book of Jasher at one time was on one of those apocryphal books, but at least it was considered okay by Apostle Paul to quote from it and from in the book of Samuel. But that was Jasher, and it just meant book of the just man. 
uh, Asher was a tribe. So I just wanted to clarify that there. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, the, the Hebron, that this town, Hebron that is mentioned. Hebron. Hebron, yeah. the same, same Hebron yes. that exists today. Yes. Do you know the importance what? of that town? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Today it's con contention between the uh, uh, well, Palestinians and the Jews about settlement. Uh, yeah, but that's always been a contentious place because that's where the patriarchs are buried up in that area. That's uh, the tomb of the patriarchs, which uh, Abraham uh, purchased. Uh, that's where. Abraham and uh, Sarah and uh, Isaac and both oh, wait, come on, <laughs> yeah, Rebecca, and then there were, yeah. there, and then um, now here's the one that this should be a surprise to you. And that's also where Jacob and Leah appear, not. Uh, no, did I get that wrong? Well, it, you've been there, and I've been there. Yeah, but and that's that's I, I really there, the I saw the, yeah. That's really the. I went there and I saw the tombs. Yeah. And, and, and as Robert was saying, it's uh, it's administered by the Palestinian Authority, or it was when I was there. Yeah, it which is. means that uh, which means that there's a lot of really bad plumbing in the town. Uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it is it is kind of uh, administered and monitored by the Arabs. Well, and even there, the the Arabs claim the lower level above the cave uh, as that that's a a mosque. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, the Jews were given the section above it. Um, And no, no, you're right. I remember like a point. Yeah. Yeah, I remember standing on the road waiting for the bus to go home mm -hmm. or back to where I worked. And I it, it, now that you mentioned I was looking uphill. So the so the, the town's built on a kind of grade. Yeah. So anyhow, to to me that's the important part of uh Hebron is that's where the patriarchs are buried. Uh, it's a point of contention because both the Jew and the Muslim claim Abraham. Um, and nobody wants to share. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go back to, uh, I think we're at the footnotes then, aren't we? Yes. Okay. Um, Susan, you want to take this to footnotes? Okay. Oh, there she is. All of the men, all of them men. Rashi follows by several modern by several modern commentators purposes that men has the connotation of men of stature. In the present context, that might mean military prowess a trait that would make all the fearful majority report of the scouts all the more shameful. And these are their names. These are, names are entirely different from the names of the tribal chieftains previously reported. Most of the names, moreover, do not appear elsewhere in the Bible. This could be an authentic ancient list of tribal military leaders distinct from tribal political heads. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. The names have phonically closer in the Hebrew, Hoshua and Joshua. The letter is a variant of the former that bears the theoprophic prefix, which means God saved. And you shall go up into the high country. 
Across, after crossing the Negrib Desert, the tribes would move into the mountainous region of Judea in eastern Cana. Are they strong or slack? The formulation of the mission of the scouts in terms of these binary opposites lead into the divided opinion of the report. The majority of 10 will focus on strong and fortification. <laughs> In open settlements, the Hebrew is liter literally encampments. This nomad terms was evidentially extended to any settlement lacking fortified walls. Given the fact that Canaan compromised, comprised a variety of city-states and regional mini-kingdoms, which were often in conflict with another, one another, the landscape abounded in fortified cities. Muster strength and take of the fruit of the land. The notion that strength is required to take a sample of the fruit of the land is the first hint that the fruit is permanently <laughs> heavy, just as the inhabitants are preterminally large. A hyperbolic or legendary indication in verse 23 is that a single cluster of grapes is so heavy that it requires two men to carry it. Offspring of the giant. The second, he the second Hebrew term here is understood by some modern translators to be an et ethnic designation. The words of the scouts, however, in verse 33, clearly place offspring of the Anqua in opposition with Nephilim, the legendary man-god hybrid mentioned in Genesis 6. And there is no indication elsewhere of an ethnic group called Anakites mm -hmm. on the basis of this chapter in all subsequent stratus of Hebrew is the standard term for giants. The legendary scale of the bounty of this land is fatness, is matched by the legendary propositions of its proportions of its inhabitants. It should be noted that this representation of Hebron, inhabited by giants, oh. swerves from the depiction of Hebron in Genesis 25, where the local Denensiaries are ordinary and commercially shrewd Hittites. Zoan in Egypt. The city is usually identified as Tanis. Eshkol is the Hebrew term for grape cluster. At the end of 40 days, the number is, of course, formulaic, but it is also a reasonably plausible time in which a contingent of men on foot might travel the Negbi from its southernmost region, make their way to northern Cana and return. They recounted to him, although Aaron and the representatives of the community are present and have been shown the spectacular samples of the fruit of the land, it is Moses as leader that they address the words of their report. It's actually flowing with milk and honey. Moses, conveying the divine promise, has repeatedly used this phrase for the fruitfulness of the land. Now the eyewitnesses confirm it, that it is actually true. The Canaanites dwell by the sea. This indication is historically accurate for the 13th century BCE, because the Philistines, who would soon, who would very soon control most of the coastal areas, had not yet arrived. We will surely group. We will surely prevail. Caleb's vehement contradictions of the majority of the scouts does not deny the substance of their report, but rather insists that even against such huge adversaries, and such an array of fortified cities, the Israelites will prevail. 
the martial resolution will be fulfilled in the biblical account a full generation later under Joshua's leadership. A land that consumes those who dwell in it. As several medieval commentators observe, the scouts now raise an ante in their negative report. At first, they did not duly note the extravagant fruitfulness of the land, together with the fearful aspect of its inhabitants. Now, in their rejoinder to Caleb, they put forth an ill report of the land itself, saying that it, it consumes the inhabitants. Japed Milgram possibly, plausibly proposed that this phrase refers to a state of repeated war in which the inhabitants of this land find themselves at the geographical crossroads between the Near East empires to the south, to the east, and to the north. The multi multiple ethnic groups, moreover, of the land itself, indicated in the scout's report, reflected armed conflict among the various natives. The land flowing with milk and honey, then, it seems, in these words, as a kind of death trap. Even if the Israelites were to succeed in obtaining a foothold and themselves became dwellers of the land, it would consume them through internecine and international warfare. <coughs> Men of huge ma measure. Huge is merely implied in the Hebrew. And so were in their eyes. This judgment has to be sheer fearful projection, for they would scarcely have spoken with the Canaanites. Okay. Um, we don't have much time left in our, our session, but uh, so they went into the land and they went all the way up to the the Golan Heights, basically, up in that area. Um, they brought back pomegranates, and that's where I saw pomegranates. Um, buddy, do you know if there are uh, pomegranates grown anywhere other than up there? I, I, I've not seen pomegranates in Israel. I worked in uh, orchards. That was my job, my initial job, but I don't remember a lot of pomegranates being grown, yeah. but Israeli, Israelis tend to grow crops that are valuable for export. So if there's money in pomegranates, they'll grow them. If there's not, they won't. Well, we went up to see Mount Hermon and the like on the tour that I was on. Um, up in, at close to the Lebanese border, that was that was um, <clears throat> what they offered uh, crushed pomegranate uh, drink. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it, it is popular, yeah, especially among the Arabs, yeah. I went on a little field trip up there with my group, but I don't remember us having any snacks. But we went up to the border and looked around up to the kind of the DMZ or whatever it was up there. Um, but, yeah, we, we didn't get any snacks. But, yeah, pomegranates are kind of a popular treat with the, with the local population, especially the Palestinians. Yeah, so anyhow, because it says... It said that, and I, I didn't know anywhere else that they they actually grow pomegranates. I, so I said that. And then it talked about going all the way into the north. So, But I had that idea because they brought pomegranates back. Uh -huh. um, it's an interesting test that the Lord was putting the children of Israel through. He sent them up. He wanted them to express their heart. Um, just like he puts us through tests. Um, it's not It's not real till it's real. It's, it's not until we live it and do it that it, uh, it has significance. So here's a case where the, the spies were sent in. Joshua and Caleb will come back and may speak uh, about how wonderful the what the Lord has placed before them. The others coming back the other way. I don't know when they said that the land will consume you. If uh, 
you know, the, the, this warring faction and stuff that the commentators are talking about, if that really was in their perspective at the time. They were only there 40 days. Um, you know, to say that the land would consume you, maybe it was too good to behold. So it, mentions, it mentions this is a uh, a race of very of large men. Yeah. And uh, so immediately I think of the Philistines and Goliath, but it says they haven't oh. migrated there yet. Where did the Philistines migrate from? Do we know? Well, the the uh, we talked a little bit last time about the Canaanites and the Philistines, and the Philistines is some ancient text and archaeological breezes are sometimes referred to as the sea people. So the, everybody's guess is they came from Crete or Cyprus or the Greek islands and settled there, which is a good place to settle. That's, uh, that, that coastal area actually is a very rich fishing ground and has been through most of history. And then, of course, the agriculture is, you know, fairly, fairly rich as well. Yeah, it's a volcanic uh, area at the same time. Up in the north, anyhow. So the land is very rich. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to close off here at this point, since we got about five minutes to go. Um, is there anything we need to talk about as a group? You can stop the, the recording at this point.